All right, guys, let's do this. Gideon versus Wainwright, 1963. Three, excuse me. This case deals directly with the concept of right to counsel, the Sixth Amendment, and the Fourteenth Amendment. All right. To get some better context in regards of Gideon versus Wainwright, let's get directly into a case that preceded Gideon versus Wainwright. So you're able to have a foundation as to why the Sixth and 14th Amendment ties into this case here. First, in 1942, there was a case called Betts versus Brady. And, and this case specifically was the fact that Betts was indicted for robbery and detained in a Maryland jail. Now, this is important because Betts claimed that he was innocent of the crime of, of, of robbery. And the reason why this case is so interesting um, is that it actually has certain connotations attached to this. And, and let me explain why, what I mean by that. What I mean is that what happened initially was that when he was tried, he was sought after by police. He was, in, he was charged with the crime. He was indicted and therefore went to jail. Before his trial, he specifically asked for counsel to represent him. He wasn't adverse to the law. He didn't understand the intricacies of the law itself. And therefore, he asked for counsel. Ironically, when he asked for counsel, he was denied of counsel and convicted of robbery in, um, in Maryland. Now, once this happened, he felt that he was wronged. He went to seek he went to seek representation in prison and he and his then his now attorney, I say then, really should, should say then attorney, filed what's called a writ of habeas corpus. And this writ of habeas corpus is a legal documentation for the law for the the courts, the appellate court to review his case and to hopefully eventually look at the evidence involved to grant him um, a new trial based upon his rights were violated. So it went all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court ruled in favor of bets. Now the second part of this is extremely important everybody. So pay attention to this concept is that even though the Supreme Court favored bets and overturn his conviction in Maryland. They specifically stated that the right to counsel must be decided on a case by case basis. So what does this actually mean? What this means is that while the charge was overturned because he was denied counsel, the Supreme Court decided, even if that's the case, we must provide some type of power to the states and the states can decide based upon a, a case by case basis based upon how many legal firms or, or individuals that are in um that out of law school um that are able to get these cases are able to have and many states didn't have a lot of lawyers right they didn't have a whole bunch of individuals they were able to um, to rely on in regards of being a lawyer, or at least a competent lawyer, that is, right? So with that in mind, we knew, at least at that time, or at least people knew at the time, that if the state's going to have power to choose what type of, um, what type of um, case deserves a lawyer, Supreme Court felt that the, that the states would be able to handle this situation and, and determine what is best for the citizens as well as based upon the resources or lawyers slash public defenders that were available. Now, this leads to the concept of Betts versus Brady. And I'm sorry, versus, versus Gideon. All right, people. Don't laugh at him. I already know how you are. All right? Don't do it. 
Jesus don't like ugly and don't mention anything about him again. This here is Clarence Earl Gideon. Clarence Earl Gideon is, 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 has an interesting story. So his father died when he was three, right? So he was, was without a male role model for basically all of his life outside of three years old. And of course, he still couldn't be able to reminisce and know who his father was. His mother remarried two years later. So literally 24 years after his, his biological father died, his mother remarried thereafter. This is important because his mother and stepfather were factory workers. Thus, they were pretty poor. So he didn't have a role model, a male role model. Um, he lived in abject poverty, even with two salaries in the household. He didn't have siblings, by the way. And he didn't have all the requisite needs that a lot of other kids would have received if their mother and father were able to provide accordingly. The background here is extremely important to grasp because this lays out a foundation to what he is doing and how he has been rolling since he was an adult. Okay, so here we go. So the next 33 years of Clarence Gideon's life, it goes like this. So he has an assortment of odd jobs, all right? He has an assortment of odd jobs overall, these odd jobs and numerous days in prison, all right? Um, so it's important to grasp this because the reason why he stayed in prison was because he had simple burglary charges upon him, right? So to be able to effectively get, you know, have some sort of consistent money in his pocket so he can survive even as an adult and even, as, even after the fact he is growing his own family. He goes to prison a couple times because of simple burglary, trying to get extra money to pay for whatever he needs to pay for his kids and so on and so forth. He literally marries four times. Now, the reason why I put this in here is because of, like his mother, trying to find a, st a stable home and to have some sort or some remblance of stability in his life. He married a few times thereafter, trying to maintain that, that, that concept, right? It's important also to note that after his fourth marriage, in 1957, he moved to Panama City and worked as a mechanic. So he's starting to find, or did find, a job where he is able to provide a little bit more that's a little bit more stable for his family. Now, also note, everyone, that one, he doesn't have a proper education because he never really had a proper education to begin with. Two, he's unable to fully grasp, you know, high complex concepts. Remember, the, the lack of education that he received due to the instability of his home, a lot of this concept, all right? His family left him after he went to jail again. So his last time he goes to jail, his family leaves him. When I mean his family, I mean his wife and his children all left him, right? He's behind, he's, now he is, he has, he has a job, not paying a whole lot, but it's stable for him and his family. He is, he's trying his best. He got, he got popped for a burglary charge. And his, and, and his wife, or then wife now, is leaving him and taking his kids. All right, so this leaves him kind of in despair a bit. All right, with this despair, leads into the issue at hand. All right, it leads into the issue at hand. So... Shortly after the infamous pool room burglary, which she was popped for, 
Gideon was arrested twice for crimes he hadn't committed. The evidence proves that the that he was not at the crime scene, at least in the other two instances. But police sought after him because within the town or within the city which he was in, he was known to have a rap sheet regarding burglary. So in other words, he was already profiled. The FBI believed he was guilty of a break-in at a local armory because, again, he was convicted of a similar crime 25 years earlier. Remember, he's a kid. He burglarized. He didn't have any other way. He was living in abject poverty. He wanted money and so on and so forth. So police or the FBI already profiled him to the point of this individual must have done these crimes, these burglaries, because there's no other individual that fit the, the modus, right, the modus operandi that he has done previously. So when the Bay Harbor bar was robbed, they also suspected Gideon. This is the FBI that is, right, and local police. They couldn't find evidence in either case, so they threw him in jail for vagrancy. So let me explain the concept of vagrancy for you. All right. So what 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 vagrancy happens to be is something that happened quite a bit back in the day. It within the 40s and the 50s. It's basically the state of living in vagrant or homelessness, right? So yes. He was arrested for technically being homeless. Um, and, and back then, that was important because if you were homeless, remember his wife left him, you didn't have steady income. The mechanic, the, the mechanic job he had was stable for only for a period of time. Now he still has to pay, you know, child support and try to help his kids out. So he doesn't have the money overall. So he doesn't have regular income coming in that would sustain his livelihood. So this arresting him for vagrancy. He's homeless, temporary out of work, petty theft stuff, things of that nature, right? J just, just so you know, vagrancy itself is illegal, right? Vagrancy, at least now, is illegal. But nevertheless, back then, they arrested him for, for vagrancy. A month after his release, so he was in jail one month, right, for being arrested for vagrancy. He was arrested for breaking into the Bay Harbor pool room. Remember what I just said earlier? They suspected Gideon, but had no evidence to prove it. So one month after his release, almost to the day, they arrested him for the burglary of the Bay Harbor pool room. And, and this here is an, an image of the Bay Harbor pool room. You notice there's a, a few pool tables in the back. There's a bar areas there for individuals, males, of course, to, to sit down, um, relax a bit and so on and so forth. This is what they said he stole. He went there to steal not just money that was behind the counter or in the safe or wherever they put it at. Also stole alcohol. Remember, he was in prison for vagrancy. Someone who was quote unquote homeless, without a steady income, petty theft, things of that nature. Throughout this time frame, everyone, he is still maintaining his innocence because he knew he wasn't there. And he's stating that the police had it out for him from the get go. Now, Officer Henry Barry Hill Jr., very young um, a police officer, was on patrol, routine patrol in his car, then eventually walking the beat of the streets 
trying to figure out what's going on, what's happening with all these these break-ins. He asked a man hanging around the front of the building at the Bay Harbor Pool Room. So a man is there already, walking the front, scoping the Bay Harbor Pool Room, and Officer Barry Hill himself asked if he knew anything about the burglary. Problem number one here is that Officer Barry Hill, knowing this particular individual is just in front of the pool room, kind of scoping it, looking around, being nosy, he is not even a suspect. So he has no, so Barry Hill is not even asking questions to him about why he's there, why he's scoping the building out, why is he in front loitering. He's asking the man himself, why, you know, who do you think knew about this issue or were a part of it? The man is named Henry Cook. Officer Barry Hill is questioning a man named Henry Cook. And Henry Cook said he saw Gideon leaving the, bid the building. Now, Cook and Gideon, which I didn't tell you before, because I really wanted to hold this off. Cook had issues with Gideon previously. And this is important to grasp because the police officer didn't know. The police officer did not know about the issue with Cook and Gideon. Okay? So, he's instantly... Asking the question regarding Cook and Gideon. And now he is trying to figure out if Gideon did this, it's Barry Hill. If Gideon did this, I need to find Gideon. Because this man who was already snooping around in front of the building, who was not asking the question, who wasn't asked why he's there snooping around, instantly named Gideon. Remember, Gideon is on the forefront of the police at the time in Panama City. The deputy found Gideon at a bar later that morning and immediately arrested him for the burglary of the Bay Harbor Pool Room. Gideon again claimed he was innocent. He was nowhere within sight of the Bay Harbor pool room. So, which leads into the concept of the actual trial. All right. So let's get to the trial part. Now, interestingly enough, the trial was held August 4th, 1961 in Bay County, Florida. Now, in this trial, when the judge asked Clarence Gideon or asked if Clarence Gideon was ready for trial, Clarence Gideon specifically stated that he wasn't and that he requested the court to appoint him counsel to represent him. Remember, just like Betts, right, he didn't have the requisite um, knowledge for law. He was unable to fully read and function and be a functional reader which means be able to read and grasp the information, absorb the information, and, and regurgitate that information out with understanding and clarity. The judge said under Florida law that he couldn't appoint a lawyer to Gideon unless he was charged of murder of a capital offense, both which threatened the death penalty. So let's let's make this clear. Under Florida law at the time, if you murdered anybody, no matter what the situation was, you were more likely to be indicted or sent or or, or tried for the death penalty. If it was a capital case in regards of it was a purposeful murder or it was a murder of a police officer or a military um, uh, individual, or someone in the fire department. It was a capital offense and therefore would be subjugated for that person to be tried under the death penalty warrant um, 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 statutes. 
So because this wasn't the case, right? This was just a burglary situation. The judge says, no, we're not going to offer you this uh, a lawyer because your your case doesn't fit within the parameters of a murder charge or a capital offense. All right. So he is denied the right to counsel. Remember about previous rulings, right? So we talked about, you know, in, in 1943 with bets. Let's talk a little bit about in 1932. Supreme Court heard a hearing regarding the same concept about counsel and the right to having a counsel. In 1932, states had to provide lawyers to poor people charged with serious crimes or murder. All right? So the Supreme Court says no matter what, if you are if you are indicted for murder, or for um, sexual assault, um, or for armed robbery um, with bodily in with bodily harm. These are serious crimes, especially murder. Lawyers must be provided to the individual for representation. S about six years later, the Supreme Court in 1938 state that poor defendants, regardless of the seriousness of the crime in which they were being charged at that time, were entitled to lawyers in federal trials. This is also important because in 1938, poor uh, defendants or impoverished defendants, they were charged with any specific crime that was set to go in federal court needed a lawyer. The problem here is that Gideon was tried for a minor offense in a state court. So one, it doesn't hit the, um, the ramifications that it needs in 1932 because it wasn't a serious crime, even though he was poor. And also it doesn't hit the 1938 Supreme Court statute that states that it has to be in a federal trial. So it's a minor offense and it's going to a state court. So he only hit one of the three concepts in which for him to receive a lawyer. All right. Again, it only hit one of the three perspectives. He was poor or impoverished. We got that, but it wasn't a serious crime such as murder, um, you know, armed robbery, or even the perspective of sexual assault, nor was this a federal crime, maybe a federal crime like money laundering uh, or any other type of white collar crime. Okay. So he stuck like Chuck, right? So let's now go to the trial. So we get to this concept. He's going, he's going to trial now. Let's talk about Gideon and also the assistant state attorney who happens to be William E. Harris. Now, the reason why it's the assistant state attorney and not the attorney for um, the, the, like the district attorney himself, simply put, is that the assistant state attorney tries cases on minor offenses while the district attorney him or herself at least at this time was a him um during the 40s and the 50s mostly him they tried cases that was much more in depth in other words they were much more important high flagrant crimes like again capital crimes murder cases um, sexual assault cases, things of that nature. All right, Gideon, he had no lawyer. So he had to provide all the, he had to do all the jobs that a lawyer would normally do and most likely do better. He had to come up with the questions. He had to do all the research of prior court cases. 
He had to understand the statutes within a reasonable amount of time. All these concepts he had to do without the help or benefit of a lawyer. All right. Um, next concept is that he didn't realize that he could even dismiss jurors. So he didn't remember. He didn't know anything about about being a lawyer. He knew about the other steps that were available. He went ahead and said, you know what? This is what I got. Right. That's all I can do. I didn't know anything about dismissing a lawyer's, I mean, uh, jurors who I felt was going to be against me because they had preconceived notions about me regarding my past and my previous history. And on top of that, even his cross examinations, him questioning the witnesses by the prosecution team had many flaws. He could have easily tried to dismiss, um, the individual who who said, who stated that he committed this um he was coming out of the of the uh, of the bar at the time of the burglary um he could have stated that the case was weak because the other um the other witnesses didn't necessarily see him or take a, had a good look at him overall there were so many flaws in the case while on the opposite side under um assistant state attorney William Harris that Harris that he presented the case against Gideon very well, knowing all the legal tactics um, that he had to go through. And with all that, he was convicted of a maximum sentence of five years in the state prison in, in Rayford, Florida. So after all this, he is now convicted of this crime. He's going to prison. That's the end of it, right? Nope. While in prison, Gideon was petitioning the Florida Supreme Court to issue a writ of habeas corpus. Remember what we talked about before in the Betts case, that Betts also written a writ of habeas corpus with the hopes that the appellate court and the Supreme Court, and the state Supreme Court, excuse me, would hear the case and be able to overturn the conviction based upon him not getting the lawyer and not being able to represent himself well based upon his background. And the fact that he was basically held illegally, that it went against his constitutional rights. When the Florida Supreme Court received this petition, they, de they de declined hearing Gideon's case. All right. Now, keep in mind, he asked for a lawyer. He got no lawyer. He was denied that lawyer. All right. So he had he didn't have a lot of time to represent himself, to understand all the case proceedings, all the trial cases and so on and so forth, to dismiss jury members, to ha ask relevant and pertinent questions. All this is happening. And on top of this. He gets a writ, he, he, he went to get a writ of habeas corpus. It was denied. But the interesting part about his denial was that there was no reason. Let me, let me say this again. No reason at all to deny him the writ of habeas corpus. They sent him the paperwork, they sent him the paperwork back with just stating denial. All right. So all this is happening to Gideon. Now, with this in mind, he only had one way out. And that way was the Supreme Court. All right. So he had only one way to try to get out of this issue. And this issue was just to go straight to the Supreme Court. Here we go. All right. Leave it here for a little bit so you can so you can get the whole gist of it, all right? Gideon's first attempt to the to the contact the Supreme Court failed. And here's why. Number 1, don't judge my my typing. I was in a rush. I know 40 is spelled wrong. Don't judge my life. All right. 
So he had to come up with 40 copies of the petition must be sent and all supporting documents must be typed. In other words, he had to literally type why he's asking for this particular peti petition of writ of habeas corpus. Also, there was a $100 fee for a petition. So at the time, you had to pay a fee just so the Supreme Court can actually read, see, and analyze the case to, to see if he is able, or they're able to listen to his case overall. All right. So some poor applicant could provide a document saying that they could pay the fee. However, Gideon just forgot to mail all this, right? He forgot to mail the, this, all this perspective. Um, and the reason why I'm saying this is extremely important is because it shows the lack of education that he has, or he doesn't have, if you will, and shows how much behind the eight ball he was in regards of representing himself. All right. So he's behind the eight ball. He's hurt. He's hurt. He, but he keeps on going, right? Because he's been wronged. He wants to figure out a way to get out of, out of prison because he did not commit this crime. He's adamant about this. Which leads into his second attempt. Now, the Supreme Court allowed him to re-petition the writ of habeas corpus. This time, he was successful. His letter included a notarized affidavit. In other words, he was able to get it notarized and make it official. You had a copy of the appeal from the Florida Supreme Court. In other words, what was the writ of habeas corpus that he sent to the Supreme Court? As well as he was able to send off the court's reply to why they refused to hear his case, which again was just denied, right? There was no explanation. In his main petition, a petition for a writ of satori directed to the Supreme Court of Florida. Now, now this is a little bit different also because you also have another one. So within his writ of habeas corpus, he had this writ of satori. In other words, in an order that the certified records of the last court to hear the case be forwarded to the Court of Appeals. So Satori is a certified records, right? They have the certified records to be sent to the Court of, um, be forwarded from the Court of Appeals to the Supreme Court itself. So all this is involved in this concept, right? Which leads into the getting his letter and petition. So he had to send this gigantic stack of papers, his huge packet, and within here was his letter and petition. His letter was still handwritten, right? And, and worst of all, it's full of incorrect grammar and spelling because of what? No education, right? Or lack of equality education or staying in school for a particular period of time to grasp this perspective, right? However, the letter intent was clear and was able to be understood by the Supreme Court justices. He claimed that his 14th Amendment had been violated, right? Now, I, I want to be clear about this, all right? I want to be clear about this. The 14th Amendment to the Constitution states specifically that all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof, right? So subject to the jurisdiction of the United States are citizens of the United States and the states in which they are state, which they reside in. 
The 14th Amendment continues by saying that no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Nor can they deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. In other words, what this 14th Amendment is saying is, number one, if you were born in the United States and born within a given state, you are a U.S. citizen. And because you are a U.S. citizen, the United States shall make laws to enhance your privileges, right? To enhance your citizenship. The United States has no right, or the state itself has no right, to deprive you of life, to deprive you of liberty, nor should they deprive you of due process of law. Now, we understand that times have changed from 1940s to 2020 and the 20-teens, right? We get that. But by law, the United States or, the, or, or each individual state cannot deny this to individuals themselves. So it, it provides this concept, this life, liberty, and property, as well as the perspective um, as well as the perspective of, of individuality, right? But also getting to believe that due process includes the right to be represented by a lawyer. So now he is dipping not in not just into the 14th Amendment. He's also dipping into the Sixth Amendment. All right. Um, so all this is happening at this time frame. Now, all this is within his petition and within his letter. All right. Now, with this in mind, it is important to grasp the next concept. This guy. All right. So he's starting to have a defense, right? Now he has a defense in Supreme Court. He can't represent himself in Supreme Court. He couldn't even represent himself in state court. All right. So the court appointed a lawyer to Gideon. His name was Abe Fortas. Abe Fortas. Abe Fortas was a, a well-known, intelligent, um, sophisticated, powerful lawyer who has, has, has tried cases in the Supreme Court several times over with a high level of success within these court proceedings. A. Fortis took this case on free of charge because he believed that Gideon's rights, his 6th and 14th Amendment rights, were harmed from the very go. And he really felt that he had a good argument to make and therefore overturn the Betts case. Now you might be asking yourself, why would you want to overturn the Betts case? Remember, what the Betts case did, yes, the Betts case proved that, that Mr. Betts was denied his 14th Amendment right and therefore was released out of prison. But the Supreme Court specifically stated that it must be on a state-by-state -state basis as to should an individual who is charged with a specific crime be granted a state-appointed lawyer 
or a state appointed attorney. A. Fortis wanted to overturn this concept by saying if an individual, if we can prove that an individual was, was without a question, denied his Sixth Amendment right, denied his um, 14th Amendment right, that the individual who asks for a state appointed attorney must be granted that attorney no matter the issue. They have the right by law and they should receive this attorney no matter what. It is their right to do so. All right? So there's a legal question at hand that must be answered. This legal question, this legal question at hand is that did the state court's failure to appoint counsel for Gideon's violate his right to a fair trial and due processes as protected by the Sixth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment. I'm not going to go over the Fourteenth Amendment because I told you what the Fourteenth Amendment happens to be. The Sixth Amendment, which you should know, by the way, but if you don't know for some reason, it is the right set forth in criminal prosecutions, like a right to a speedy trial and a public trial with an impartial jury. Remember in this case, the jury members had a preconceived notion for individuals who were tried and convicted of burglary before because it was allowed in opening in, in, in the opening. They already convict they would have already convicted him in their mind no matter what. The tr jury was already partial to this. So this was a legal question. Did the state of Florida Failure to appoint the counsel violate the 6th and 14th Amendment for Mr. Gideon. And the decision was that in April, in March 18th, 1963, after deliberating on Gideon's case for approximately two months, in a unanimous decision, the Betts case should be overturned. And therefore, because the Betts case would be overturned, Gideon's case would be overturned as well. Justice Hugo Black, who provided a specific majority decision, stated that it spoke of the controversy since Betts was decided. In other words, it spoke to them as to no matter the situation, right? No matter the concept that the Betts case or any individual, let's go with any individual, who asked specifically for a, an attorney granted by the state should and must receive said attorney. He noted that the similarities between Betts and Gideon's case was very eerie. And because of this, it is important that everyone's constitutional rights be upheld, no matter the cost to the state. Therefore, the Betts case, um, et al. Gideon's case, should be overturned. Now, let's look at interest groups. Now, yes. I know I show you support and op opposition, right? You might ask yourself, you just said just a, a, a second ago that there was a unanimous decision in this case. I did. This unanimous decision came from the Supreme Court, not interest groups. So there's groups that are interested in this particular case overall. In regards of support, because the American people are getting more freedoms and liberties 
Individuals themselves must be and are protected under the Constitution. This is argued by the American Civil Liberties Union. In other words, the ACLU specifically is stating since more people are getting more freedoms and liberties based upon the interpretation by the Supreme Court of this modern Supreme Court, at least in the 40s, they were much more modern. The individuals must be must have representation. And if they cannot afford representation, the ACLU would assist them in finding representation in regards of being their lawyers if their rights are denied. So if their rights were denied, they can always appeal. That appeal will go also to them as well. They will hear about it and they will try to get involved in to maintain and possibly even enhance the rights that we all have as individuals. Now, the opposition interest group stated that it would be harder to sentence someone and possibly would be would be would create cases that are in this that are disputed. In other words, what they're saying is if you allow this to happen, or at least the opposition is saying, by you allowing the bets case to be overturned, you're going to have number one, an overcrowding of court cases pending. Two, many people who are guilty are going to feel that they can figure out a way to get out of prison and therefore would appeal any and all cases to the Supreme Court if possible, which clogs up the appellate and the Supreme Court um, funnel. This leads into the Miranda warning. In other words, any case, in any court, you are guaranteeing an attorney, no matter the circumstances. As a matter of fact, it is specifically written in the Miranda warning. Later on in the 60s, about 15 years later, really 14 years later, the Miranda versus Arizona case comes to be and it ties in the concept of knowing individual rights about remaining silent. Anything can you, that you say can and will be used against you in a court of law specifically when you are arrested. And of course, you have a right to talk to in a lawyer and have him present with you while you are being questioned. In other words, now everybody, no matter what the situation may be, will be allowed to obtain a lawyer for representation, no matter the crime. <coughs> Excuse me. With that in mind, it's important to grasp what I believe about this case. Honestly, I believe the Supreme Court got this right. And I believe the reason why they got it right is because if an individual is denied any portion of their rights, the Supreme Court at the highest court of the land must be able to understand and to explain why these rights that's within the Constitution are vital. But no, number two, that if an individual is wrong by the state in which they live, it is up to the federal courts and the Supreme Court to right the wrongs that the state or the county or the parish has done to them. All right. It is highly important that this is understood and grasped. Okay. With that in mind. This ends the concept of this case, All right? I look forward to giving you more information about this and going over again when we get ready for our AP test, all right? <coughs> Pardon me. I'm going to also provide you with my notes along with this and some requisite information to assist you with this concept. Please make sure you take notes on this concept. I will have a very detailed um, examination on the court cases in which we did not that we did not do in class, as well as the ones that we did when we do come back from this hiatus from the coronavirus. 
I hope everyone stays safe and be well and are blessed. Make sure that you have any questions, comments, or concerns about this case, you email me. All right? Y'all have a good day.